morning, everyone. That's a beautiful song, isn't it? Uh, thank you, God. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So who, who has known God in their life for more than, no, less than five years? Anyone here? Yeah. What about 10 years? Less than 10 years? Let, yeah? You're five? Yeah? What about, um, okay, 15? 15? 15 years. In that range. Zero to 15. Yeah? All right. Zero to, uh, let's go zero to, what, 20? Yeah? Zero to 25? Uh huh, uh huh. Zero to 30? I think, I think it's more. Zero to 35? Yeah? 40? I think I'm sort of 35, 40, somewhere in there. Yeah? Yeah, I couldn't work it out. Okay, 50. Oh, yeah. See, 55. Yeah. And, you, all right, and, you, and you're still here in church. Isn't that amazing? Yes. You're still, you're still gathering together amongst the saints and lifting your hearts before the one who has never left you, right? Has never failed you. Did you get up this morning and was he with you? Yeah? I mean, do you often sit back and just contemplate on this journey, however long it has been? You know, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, retrospectively looking at time and experiences truly is a faith-building experience. It really is. Because you've seen where God has always been. Always been at work, always bringing about his purpose and always keeping us hanging on, you know. Hanging on, knowing that he will never let us go, he will never fail us. That's a beautiful song, isn't it? Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Uh, well, again, good morning and um, I trust you're well, you're here. Um, I know we all have things going on in our lives and so... If you would just bow your head with me and your hearts before him who cares for us more than we can even begin to imagine. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are our God. You are our loving saviour. You are a compassionate, soon coming king. You are the promise giver and keeper. And what a wonderful thought it is, Lord that you have gone to prepare a place for us and that where you are, you will come again and you'll receive us unto yourself. What an amazing truth that is, Lord God. No matter how long it is that you would have us sojourning on this planet, experiencing your provision, experiencing your blessing and indeed experiencing your work, even of correction, your work of, of, of sanctification, Lord God. Every day at work, every day with us, with that glorious hope before us that knowing that you're coming again to receive us unto yourself and you will not fail. You will not abandon us. I thank you for the comfort of that truth, and Lord. And even in the midst of our struggles and those that are amongst us and those that are not with us, we think of joy in hospital, Lord, and we think of many others, Lord, who are struggling in their health, Lord, that, uh, to know that you are present even in the midst of this struggle and you will not fail. You will bring about your perfect work, your perfect will, your perfect plan. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your healing touch as we have already prayed in song of worship today, Lord God. Strengthen us for what it is you have us here for this moment, this morning. 
Bless our hearts, Lord, as we commit ourselves to your word and surrender our lives, Holy Spirit, to your work again of sanctification, Lord. Thank you, Father, for having your way in our life, for there is no other way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. All right, Philippians chapter 2. Um, here's my promise today. I won't keep you long. Okay. No. I will not keep you long. Uh, go to chapter 2. And um, we're picking it up in verse 19. And uh, look at a few verses there. So last time we were together, oh, got to say this. Who was here last week? Who wasn't here last week? All right, so this will mean nothing to you unless you were online. Um, I I walked out of here and I went to the shopping centre. You know what I'm going to say? I went to the shopping centre. I walked into the shopping centre and who should appear right in front of me? It's about a a girl wearing her pyjamas in the shopping centre. And Monday, I went, to the, I went to the servo next door. This is North Road, next door to the North Road Shopping Centre. I'm filling up my car there, and I'm looking, looking across back to the shopping centre, and there is, and the bottle shop is just there. Car pulls up. A man this time jumps out of his car in his pyjamas, goes rushing into the bottle shop, rushes back out with what he wanted. I rest my case. Yeah. So if you weren't here last week, I know that means nothing. But uh, yes. <laughs> mm. All right. Sorry about that. So last week we were looking. We were looking at these closing verses in this second chapter. And, um, and what was held up before us, of course, was the Apostle Paul as an example of what it is to be a Christ follower. And, um, and that example being someone, being someone who, having seen Jesus, someone who, having heard Jesus, becoming someone who surrendered themselves to what they have seen and what they have heard in Christ, someone knowing the true, the true satisfaction in life, someone knowing or someone full of joy, someone rejoicing in a life of sacrificial service to God, you know, rejoicing in the advancement of the gospel, you know, looking at life as the Apostle Paul we saw a few weeks back, looking at life and the experiences all along the way, realizing that every, every path that the Lord has led us down is a vehicle by which the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ is being spread. Uh, and that's what a Jesus follower, a Christ follower is all about. Allowing their lives to be a vehicle for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why you know, I wanted just to, to briefly look at these examples that, are, that have been given to us, right? So, there, so let me just tell you, here's, here's, a, here's an example where that doesn't happen. Having seen, having heard, but do not surrender their lives to the things that they've seen and they've heard. The Sermon on the Mount, you love the Sermon on the Mount? You know, um, this wonderful discourse that Jesus shares with the disciples and certainly others that were gathering around at that time. But at the end of it, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7, at the end of it, there is this statement, Matthew recording what he has heard and what he has seen, and he says that the people that were there were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he spoke with an authority that they had never seen before. And it touched their hearts. 
They were astounded. They were astonished by the things that he was saying. And then Matthew goes on as you follow through, following the Sermon on the Mount. He continues to record the things that he has seen. He has heard. And now the things that he has seen, he sees people. He sees, he sees, he sees Jesus. He watches as lepers are healed. He watches as the paralyzed servant of Cornelius is raised up. He watches as, as Peter's mother-in-law is raised up from a, from a, from a feather. He watches... He watches as people are being delivered from demon possession. And Matthew, seeing all of this, noted that a great multitude was coming like a wave was coming to him over and over again. And he's watching this and it says there in that account that he healed all of them, every single one of them. Right? Amazing, isn't it? But then he points out And I want to trust you to go and read this yourselves. But then he points out that amongst those multitudes that are coming like wave after wave because they have heard and because they have seen, there are others there that are recognising again that Jesus was no charlatan. What they were hearing, what they were seeing was truth, right? You know, in fact, one of those that came to him was a scribe. Now, a scribe is a learned class of within the ancient, when the ancient, when the ancient Israel, a learned class, and and they study the scripture. In fact, their their chief responsibility, most of you will know, is to copy to preserve the word of God, and so it remains in its original purity. So they are there to protect it from any corruption. They are there to protect it from any additions. They are there to protect it as they, as, they, as, they, as they copy it from parchment to parchment to make sure there are no deletions, there is no change in it at all. Right? These are men who knew the Scripture. They knew the scripture. And this man, Matthew tells us, one of these scribes, this learned man, was watching in amongst of all of that multitude. And he was listening in amongst of all of that multitude. And he was convinced the things that he was seeing, hearing Jesus say, and the things that he was doing, he was convinced they're in keeping with the scripture. They're in keeping with what God had revealed. And he was convinced that everything that Jesus was doing and saying was from God. Right? You would say there is someone, there is someone who has certainly been drawn into the kingdom, certainly been drawn to the Saviour, right? And that scribe approaches, Jesus is actually about to get in a boat. He and the disciples are going to go across the Sea of Galilee and have one of those amazing experiences out on the water, right? But as they're just getting ready to, to get into the boat, that scribe, I can see the image. That scribe sort of breaks free from the pack of the people that are around and finds his way to Jesus and simply says, Teacher, I'm going to follow you wherever you will go. He's seen and he's heard. I will follow you wherever you go. But here's the thing. The response that he got was probably not what he was looking for. Because it was a kind of, uh, Really? It was a kind of a really response. You're going to follow me everywhere, anywhere I will go? And then Jesus said those now famous words that you will all remember. When he said unto him, he looks at him and says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air, they have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay down his head. Right? You know what Jesus is saying? He said, I'm not here in this world to rest. I'm not here to find rest in this world. He's saying, I am not here to find earthly glory in this world. And we have no response from that man. Right? I will follow you everywhere you go. Anywhere. Right? He's heard, he's seen. Right? But it says then in that same passage, go and read it. It says in chapter 8 of Matthew, it says, but then another, and it says of his disciples... A disciple is a learner, someone who's following. Again, someone who's hearing, someone who's seeing. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. Right? You know what he's saying? He's saying, let me put all of, all of my responsibilities, all the responsibilities I have in this life, in this world, let me, let me put them first. Let me take care of them and I'll follow you. 
right? What did Jesus say? Remember his response? He said to him, you follow me now and let the dead bury the dead, right? And of course, again, there came no response whatsoever from either of these men. They had seen with their eyes. They had heard with their ears. But they were not, would not allow themselves to surrender to what they have seen and what they have heard. And it stops there for them, right? Do they become followers of Christ, Christ followers? It would appear not. Again, to be a Christ follower means he has become everything to us. Right? Everything to us. And the truth is this. um, Again, very simple message this morning. The truth is this, that every single one of us is following something. Right? Following someone. And the reality is this. We can only ever follow one thing. Do you know that? We can only follow one thing at a time. I'll add that on the end. Because whatever you follow is taking you in a direction and you can only ever be going in one direction at a time. Have you ever tried to go in two different directions at the same time? You can't do that and remain living. You've got to... Right? You can only follow in one direction at a time. You can only be going in the direction of that thing that you surrender your life to. A Jesus follower isn't following friends. Oh, What? A Jesus follower isn't following friends. A Jesus follower isn't following the popular culture that is around them. A Jesus follower isn't even following their own selfish desires. A Jesus follower, let me say this, isn't even following their family. They have friends. They live in a culture. They know the deceitfulness of their own desires and they, yes, they love and they honour and they respect their family, but they're following Jesus. They're following Jesus Christ. He sets the direction of their life. They've seen him. They've heard him. He's all that they want. Am I, sur- am I describing any of us? I hope I am. He's all that they want. And they surrender themselves to what they have seen and what they have heard in Christ. We saw that in the Apostle Paul last week. As Christ poured out his life in sacrificial service. And they who like Paul, they who like Christ, have poured themselves out into other people's lives. They've been, they have seen amazing things take place. It's kind of why I asked you, Has he ever abandoned you? Has he ever let you down? Has he ever disappointed you? Now, you've got incredible stories, haven't you? Who was the... who? I won't do the numbers again. (laughs) Incredible things. You've seen faith born in people, haven't you? You've, You've seen faith strengthened in those that you've come alongside of as you've imitated Christ. You've seen you've seen people comforted, you've seen people encouraged, you've seen God at work all the time. It was, you know, and this was the joy of Paul's life, right? He rejoiced in this privilege of serving his God. He rejoiced, you know, it's a privilege of being used by God as God awakens people to the reality of a spiritual life. That's why we're still here. Because that's what he wants to do. And walking with them, experiencing God's presence in, in both the highs and the lows, the, you know, the victories and even the struggles. It's all about being a part of that. It's seeing, God, it's seeing God save and grow and transform people's lives. And that's when your heart is truly blessed. And that's when you're overflowing with joy and rejoicing. This is a Christ follower. This is what that is. You want to see another one? Timothy, right? Read these verses with me, if you will. We're in chapter, verse 19 of chapter 2. It says, But I trust, in the, I trust the Lord, Jesus, remember, 
Of course, Paul's in prison, remember? We'll come back to that. He says, I trust in the Lord to send Timothy to you shortly. These are the, to the Philippian believers. Remember, he's in prison in Rome. That I also may be encouraged when I know your state, when I know how you guys are going. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know, but you know his proven character. This is Timothy. That as a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how things go with me, Paul says. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come unto you again. I have this plan. I have this desire. And I'm trusting in the Lord for it, he says. So Paul, imprisoned in Rome, is waiting for his trial um, and with him is Timothy. Timothy has been with him all along, right? Epaphroditus is also there. Epaphroditus was a man who the, the Philippian believers sent to Rome to bring a love offering, a gift to Paul, to encourage Paul in his imprisonment. So, so Timothy is there. Epaphroditus is there. Epaphroditus is going to take this letter that you are reading. Epaphroditus is going to take it back to the believers at Philippi, right? Now, it seems from the verses that you and I just read is that Paul expects his trial to come up to happen pretty soon. And if, and if released, he has a plan. So he's trusting the Lord. If, he's expecting, actually, that he might be released. It says if he is released, you know, he... he um, he's, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. If he is released, then he... He's going to go and see them personally at, at Philippi, right? But if he's not released, or if the trial is postponed, because he's been there nearly two years at this point, and if the trial is postponed, then I'm going to send Timothy. You know, and he's going to go and see them, right, and, and let them know how things are going with him. And then Timothy's going to come back and report to Paul how things are going with them, Right? That's, that's, the, the, the sense, that's the sense of what we get out of, out of this. But what is very noteworthy is that Paul gives us this glowing testimony of the character of Timothy. And, you know, and it's not an introduction to, the Philipp, to those at Philippi. You've got to know that. No, no they know him very well. Because Timothy was with Paul when Paul planted the church there in Macedonia at Philippi. And he has been traveling with Paul over the years. In fact, he has visited there on more than one occasion since then, right? No, it's not an introduction. Not an introduction at all. Timothy is being held up as an example of a Christ follower who is intentional in making an impact for Christ. Timothy is being held up as a Christ follower who is intentional in making an impact for Jesus Christ. Right? This is here who he is. He is someone who willingly makes deliberate choices. Hear these adjectives. Hear these descriptive words, right? He is someone who willingly one, deliberately another, makes these choices to do what is most important. You see, the one again who knows what is right, the one who talks about what is right, the, the, the one who is defending, even defending what is right, that one is to be commended, right? We, we commend that person. And, and rightly so. But what if that is where their commitment to what is right ends? Talks about it. Defends it. Knows it. What if that's where their commitment ends? If that's the case, then they fall 
far, 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 I sound like my granddaughter right now, they fall far, far, far short of the one who knowing and speaking and defending who then stands up deliberately, willingly, voluntarily to be or to do what is and to be what is right. This is Timothy. This is Timothy. You know, he was a young man who had his own struggles, didn't he? You know, he ultimately would become the he would ultimately become the uh, the uh, the pastor, if you will, at the church of Ephesus. There, you know, he will stay in, in and out of Paul's life for for some year, for a couple of few years to come, right up until the time that Paul is executed. It's believed that Timothy will make his way to see Paul when Paul is uh, is arrested again after he's released from this imprisonment. And Timothy is very much a part of the heart and the purpose of Paul. He has walked with him. He has served with him, right? And Timothy is this incredible, incredible example of a Christ follower. Yes, yes, he had his problems. Yes, he had his struggles. You know, clearly, he was a timid individual. Clearly, in his ministry, he was intimidated by people, you know. You know, Paul would say to him, you don't let anyone, anyone despise your youth. Stand up, Timothy. In the face of it, be strong, Timothy. Don't back down. Preach the word of God. You know? I mean, he would later write to him in 2 Timothy, which is Paul's last epistle just prior to his, his execution. He would say to Timothy, he writes, Timothy, you need to stir up the gift of God which is in you. You've got to stir it up, Timothy. You've got to keep serving, Timothy. Why? Because he says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, Timothy. You know, he had his battles, didn't he, right? Yes, he had his battles, but it did not stop him. This is what I want us all to see. This is very simple. It did not stop him from standing and demonstrating genuine Christian character. You know, Paul says here, I am sending Timothy. Why? Because I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which... And not the things which are of Christ Jesus. You know what Timothy is about to do? Timothy is about to go on a hazardous round trip journey of some 2,600 kilometres over treacherous terrain in a very perilous world. That's what he's about to do. And despite his natural inclination of timidity, is that a word? Despite that natural inclination, he will intentionally, he will purposefully, he will willingly choose to go. Choose to go. His choice is for his life, and we've all got to do this. His choice is for his life to make an impact for Christ in this world. That is the determining factor of the godly character of this Christ follower. But what we have to see is that as Paul is asking this of him, and he says there that I have no one like-minded, literally no one equal of the same, some say equal sold. The idea is no one equal of the same mind. I mean, Paul has looked around him. You know, there are many believers there in Rome where Paul is held captive and he's looked around him and he has found no one else who could do what he is asking of Timothy here. And I want to tell you, it's not the journey. It's not that perilous, hazardous journey. That's not the emphasis here. I mean, that's a great sacrifice indeed. But the character that Paul recognises within Timothy was the fact that he sincerely cared for their state. That's it, right? And it's that sincerity of care in him for his fellow believers that said, I'm going. I'm going. He was driven by this genuine, sincere, that means genuine, by this genuine interest in their well-being. I tell you, this is a chief characteristic of a Christ follower. 
And it's not hard to recognize. You know that? Not hard to recognize at all. And look, we can be, you might say this is a bit overarching, Chris, but we can be or spend our time worrying about ourselves exclusively or we could have a concern of care for others. Now you can look at me and say, oh, come on, Chris, the world's not that black and white. Life's not that black and white. But you know, it kind of is. It kind of is. We go one way or another. We do. Either our concern is for ourselves, either that is a defining characteristic of our life, or our concern is for others as a defining characteristic of our life. And the genuineness of it is not easy to see. How, how you ask? I'm glad you ask. <laughs> the genuineness of it is not easy to see because this is where I started. Because that genuine sincerity of care within a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, it's not easy to see because it moves us in a direction towards a need. It moves us in a direction towards a need. The genuineness of Timothy's sincerity of care has sent him and moved him in a direction for, of 2,800 kilometres towards the need. Here's the question for all of us to answer. How far away is the need? Right? Because God puts them before us all the time. I would hazard to say, that's the wrong word, I would say he does it every single day. He puts the needs of our fellow brothers and sisters before us all the time. My question is, how far away is that need? a brother and sister in need. You see, we do go one way or the other. It does become a defining characteristic of our, of our lives. And I have to say this this morning. We all too often find ourselves going where there is no need. That's where we're safe. That's where we're comfortable. That's where we're not challenged. It's revealing, isn't it? It's revealing the sincerity of care that we have for one another. God wants us to reach out to another in a, I'll say it again, in sincerity of care. Again, just being genuine, the real thing. I'm just inviting you this morning to join me, because I'm preaching to myself here, right? To join me in a hatred for this phony, do we still say this? This phony baloney concern that we show for people in our hearts. You know, it's epitomised by, by the Australian culture, you know that? You walk down the street and here comes someone you've known most of your life. You walk down the street, they're walking towards you. How you going, mate? Yep. How you going, mate? And no one's waiting for an answer. No one's pausing to find out the reality of that question. You know what? The reality of that question should be at the, at the, at one of the uttermost things within our hearts and our lives towards one another when we gather in a place like this, when we are talking about our God and we're talking about trusting him and singing songs of knowing or being reminded that he'll never leave us, he'll never abandon us. When we're talking about this, the, the reality of understanding that we're here for one another and there is a genuineness of our concern, it should be of the utmost importance in our lives. It should be a defining Principle, if you will, not principle, yeah. Yeah, principle will do. It should be a reality of our character, right? So join me, will you, in this, in hating this phony baloney concern that so we often have in our hearts. How far away is the need? That's the question. How you going, mate? Not so good. I'll be praying for you. 
and walk away. Yeah, you'd be praying, but what are you praying for? You know? Phony baloney. I don't think we say that anymore, do we? If the need is before us and we know that God wants us to move, then let us be intentional. Let us be intentional Make to be, to be a person who is making an impact for Christ in this world. Let it move us is what I'm challenging us to this morning. Let us move us towards the real, the real reality of the life of those that are near and dear to us. Do you remember chapter 1? Apostle Paul was um, referring to other believers and, and, and it's just phony baloney. He was referring to other believers and, and it said that they were doing church. He's in prison, they're out there doing church, but it was out of selfish motivation. Do you remember that? You know, it says they were motivated by envy and by strife and, they, and that it was from selfish ambition, not sincerity, Said, he said, supposing to add to my chains. They were taking advantage of the fact that the Apostle Paul was in prison and they were using it against him to draw others unto himself. Phony, baloney, right? What are you doing listening to that guy? What are you doing listening to him? He's in prison. He's been there, in and out of prison for the last five years. Why are you listening to that? I don't know if this is what's been said, but this is the sense of it. How can you trust him? How can you listen to him? Come with us. We'll keep you on the straight and narrow. That's not really caring, is it? There's no genuineness of sincerity there, right? Well, again, Paul says, I have no one like-minded who will, with sincerity of care, care for your state. Only Timothy. He's the only one. What does he say? For all seek, in verse 20, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. See, isn't that the world apart from Christ? Isn't that where we came from? Do you remember? I mean, it is good back to reflect every now and then. You know, do you remember, don't you remember? I mean, we had this group of people that we hung out with and we, and we called them friends, you know? But in reality, everyone was into themselves. Um, Paul's challenged us over and over again in this second chapter. You know, he said back in verse, the beginning verses, when he challenged us to the ultimate example, of genuineness, of genuine care, of someone committed to making that difference. Who was it? It was Jesus, right? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of heart let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This is Timothy. He was such a man unselfish, genuinely concerned for the needs of others. Now some might think, but that's Timothy. I mean, we know the story of Timothy. I mean, after all, he, he was raised in a home by two godly, godly women who ensured that... that uh, he was raised up in the truth and the knowledge of, of Christ. You know, Paul will say again in, that, in that, that last letter that he will write to Timothy, and he will say from childhood, you know, you have known the Holy Scriptures, and, and that, that, that you have them, and they're able to make you wise, and wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You, you've got all of this, Timothy. You've had this all of it. That's Timothy. Not to mention the fact that, well, he spent probably nearly 20 years serving with the great apostle Paul. And you say, but that's Timothy. But no, let's remember. I know I've already said it, but let's remember. He had his struggles, didn't he? He had his struggles, but again, like Paul, like Timothy, and I've got to say it, like you and like me, we have seen Christ, have we not? You've seen him, haven't you? You've heard him, haven't you? We've all heard him. We've all seen him. 
But will we surrender ourselves to what we've seen and heard in him? That's the question. To abide in him daily. To seek him daily. To learn from him daily. That's what surrendering is. Daily, moment by moment, following him. And then he will do what only he can do. He will work in us and through us with a sincerity of care for those around us and we will be moved in the right direction. Right? Same message for the last three weeks. We have to yield ourselves. We have to surrender ourselves. It's then, we, it's then we will begin to live like the example that is before us, a Christ follower, intentional, intentional, to get up every day, intentional. There's a, driven, there's a driving intentional purpose within us to make the best choices, the right choices for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. Amen? Amen. Timothy, this, me, this timid little man. I saw that. I am done. Timothy, this timid little man. Young man, I should say. <sighs> Lives such a life. All the days of his life. Tradition tells us he died when he was 80 years old. It's a good age, isn't it? He was still ministering at 80 years of age. Still, every single day, getting up determined to do what is best for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And one day he got up and he went into Ephesus there and he saw a parade going down the street. And it was a parade celebrating a pagan deity. And he couldn't but speak into that situation. He couldn't but be the example of Christ that he had seen in Paul, that he had heard in Christ. He couldn't but be that example. And he went into the midst of that crowd and he told them, This has to stop. And amongst that crowd, there were those with clubs and stones. And they tell us that they beat him to death, dragged him through the streets. And that was the end of little timid Timothy. Nothing timid about that man. He continued to grow in this incredible character of God. We need this character, don't we? Intentional. Father in heaven, let us all, let us all be intentional in the, th- in the day, in the, in, the, in the life that we live, Lord. Whatever the things are that rise up against us, whatever those selfish things that want to keep us from moving towards the needs that you place before us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that what we have seen and heard in Christ would be the motivating force that would move us in the direction of the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you, to lift up your name to honour you in this place by by being here and ministering to one another and encouraging one another and moving towards each other. Thank you for this, Lord. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. A couple of things before we continue with worship. Uh, Worship Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, 14th of August. And Ice Cream Sunday after... 
So if you need a prayer, come forward so we can pray for you either during the song or after the song. Oh, yes.